Yeah, I would like to start uh, with a short video. <coughs> So this is our motivation. And airborne optical sectioning is a new imaging technique that allows to remove occlusion caused by vegetation, such as forest, in real time from aerial images. It's based on a signal processing principle called synthetic aperture sensing being used in many fields, uh, basically when the signal quality of sensors depends on the size of sensors and you have limitations on how large sensors can be built. So a classical example would be a radio telescope where the dishes have limited size and you can network multiple radio telescopes and combine their signals computationally to mimic a better signal, basically mimicking uh, the signal that you would get from a really, really large radio telescope. So that principle is applied in many fields and we apply it in optics. Uh, we basically use camera drones that have um, a limited aperture optics, meaning that the size of the lenses that these cameras use uh, is very small, few millimeters, and the images that you get from these cameras have a large depth of field. That means everything that is captured is in focus, no matter how far it is away, pretty much. So here you see images captured by a drone. <coughs> and with airborne optical sectioning, what is being done is we capture multiple images at different places. And that area in which we capture represents a synthetic aperture. So basically the size of a virtual lens. And we combine these images or the signal in these images computationally to get a new image that would be captured with a lens of a size that's physically not possible, so several hundreds of meters, for example. And what these images have is they have a shallow depth of field, which means everything that is in focus um, is visible sharp, but everything that's not in focus, that's away from the focal plane, is uh, defocused so much that it disappears in your optical signal. So with that, we can computationally slice through vegetation and make things visible that are located at a computational focal plane. And that is where the name comes from. Um, um, optical sectioning is a technique in microscopy where you slice through a specimen with your focal plane to produce a focal stack, and we just do that here uh, at a much larger scale. So there are a couple of applications where removing occlusion is important. For example, in archaeology, when you want to make architectural structures visible that are overgrown by forest. So that is what we did at the beginning. Uh, but also in wildlife observation, for example, that is important. And this is a small project we did together with ornithologists close to the German border at the Inn River, where you, where you actually find one of the largest population of breeding herons in Europe. And the ornithologists are interested in counting how many birds are there, how big the population is. And doing that from the ground is difficult because the nests are um, in the in the trees. So a good time for counting is during nesting period when the birds are mainly static in the nests, not flying around. So from the air, as you see here, also not possible because of occlusion caused by the treetops. So what we did here in, a, in an experiment, we used our research prototype and scanned this region. 
using AOS and uh, you'll see that in, in a second the scanning region was about 40 to uh, 40 by 20 meters in size and from that uh, information we compute images that simulate lenses of that size 40 by 20 meters and these images have a really shallow depth of field we you see we capture here in the visible range in RGB but also in the far infrared range that's thermal um, and with that data we can optically slice through the forest uh, layer by layer and we can detect then the nests at different layers and even can see how many birds uh, are in the nests if there are young birds or old birds adult birds uh, if the nests are used or new or old so this kind of classification was done by the ornithologists manually by browsing through the data and looking at, uh, at the results. And that is where this um, <coughs> LIT project started because we had an idea um, that we wanted to investigate and that was to see if this technology can be used for search and rescue. In search and rescue we have also big problems in terms of occlusion. When people get lost, um, search and rescue people use helicopters to find people, but if they are lost in woods, in forest, because of occlusion that's difficult to do. So one goal was to find out can we use this technology for search and rescue, and the other goal was to find out can we do person classification automatically using neural networks? Can we automatically find people? Can we build an autonomous drone that goes out and searches automatically for people without having people, without having pilots in a, in a helicopter that searches manually? And um, what you see here is basically two thermal images of two different types of forest, broadleaf forest and uh, conifer forest. And in the big images, these are the normal thermal images, you barely see people yeah, because they are occluded. But in the small images at the bottom, you see the result of AOS where we focus on the ground surface and can clearly detect shape of people. So the question is, can a computer um, find people, identify people automatically, not being confused by other things that are around and simply look like it could be a person. So to make things short, this is the results. Um, we did prove in this project that automatic person classification in normal images is not possible, simply even if you have a really good training database, simply because you would see only bits and pieces of people in images and that's not enough information for a machine learning system to learn what is a person actually and what is some um, false positive, some outlier that just looks like a person. Um, but with AOS up front, so when we remove the occlusion and then do classification, that works much better, much better. So we achieve uh, detection rates of far over 90% under realistic conditions. We do still have uh, false positives, but it's a nice stock, so uh, we don't blame it for it. So um, we spent almost a year <coughs> next to the building here to produce a training database. We gave a lot of Amazon vouchers to students to help us to produce this training database. So that was actually done here. And we um, did almost every day uh, field studies in the forests around the university. So people were making fun of us already because we, we were leaving every morning with yoga matrices to the forest. But that is how we got the data and the results. And once we proved that um, automatic person classification is really feasible and uh, practical with drones using AOS up front, we built actually the first um, fully autonomous, autonomous search and rescue drone. So the computations that I explained to you before were done offline. We used the drones only for imaging. This drone does everything online on the drone. So the occlusion removal is done on the drone, the classification is done on the drone. And because we get the results in real time, we can use this information to have the drone even to decide how to fly. So the path uh, planning of the drone is done in real time by the drone. It decides by itself how to fly, where to fly, with the goal to find a person as quickly and as reliably as possible. So this is the very first fully autonomous search and rescue drone prototype. So from here, we started, we actually follow this idea of seed projects and get some more money for building Christophorus X together with a pretty strong consortium, um, including UMTC, 
the police and also the uh, Swiss mountain rescue uh, team Rega. Um, this is a long endurance drone that uses a piston engine, flies several hours, and it was supposed to be equipped with AOS and our technology to support uh, mountain rescue people to find people autonomously with these drones, maybe together with helicopters and pilots. This project was rejected because of a lacking business plan, unfortunately. So we started to take our technology and transfer it to um, those drone systems that are used by blue light organizations today. They use mainly commercial systems from DJI enterprise systems that are actually built for these applications. And our system now runs on the remote controllers in real time of these systems. It's available for free for all blue light organizations so they can use the technology immediately with the existing systems. So this is the current um, technology transfer part that we did. What's next? So the biggest problem that we have is motion. <coughs> What you're seeing here is a moving herd of red deer. And you see that because the sampling process of AOS is sequential, um, even if we do this very quick, we fly with more than 60 meters per second with the drones at the moment. Um, still, when we have motion during the sampling process, we end up with some sort of motion blur in the images that we get. And that motion blur um, prevents from classification, from counting, from even tracking uh, objects. So we need to be able to deal with motion in future. And um, one research prototype that we have built that does this is this uh, one. It uses a 10 meter wide carbon fiber arm where uh, 10 cameras are attached to. So we capture 10 images at the same time, not sequentially anymore. And you can think of that as 10 meter wide arm represents a 10 meter large lens because that is the signal that we try to approximate with these images. So this is the very first practical solution that does true foliage tracking, a big uh, or an important research problem in the computer science, computer vision community. You see in the images, in the videos down <coughs> on the, on the uh, right, that we, with this we can detect people and we can actually track them when they are moving, while this is not possible in single images or in normal videos. Um, we were just granted a new bigger research project from um, DFG and F FAF money together with the German Aerospace Center and the University of Magdeburg to use drone swarms in future for AOS. So these drone swarms will be able to adaptively sample now. They can change their positions for sampling depending on local situations that we don't consider at the moment. For example, local density differences in the forest. It makes more sense to capture images through less dense than through sparse, uh, through more dense regions. And they will also be able to adapt to motion. So this is a project that we start, start in April um, and we look more for autonomous, fully autonomous drone swarms. And the field experiments we do will be done in research areas in Germany, in Oberpfaffenhofen, where they have a big research airport. We are also looking at wildfires. Wildfires is getting a more difficult problem also for Austria. It's not a problem of Southern Europe anymore. Um, here it is important to detect wildfires very, very early <coughs> to prevent them or to defend them effectively. Um, basically, when you detect flames and smoke, it's already too late. Um, we need to be able to detect wildfires while the fires are still on the ground, ground fires or hot spots in the ground. That is difficult to detect because of occlusion. The trees are not burned at that point. Um, and we hope that we can use AOS and machine learning to fully autonomously monitor forests to detect these uh, wildfires very, very early. This is actually another LIT proposal we submitted last time. It's not... Um, decided yet, I guess. We are still waiting for the decision. Um, but this is another activity that we are looking at. That's it from my side. I leave you with an outtake video that shows that our work is sometimes exciting, especially for me, who has basically takes the risk here. And I'm open for questions. <coughs>